Hey, good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, the Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back to Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Here's a question that sounds like science fiction, but is very much reality. Can your brain communicate directly with the computer? Now, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know in the original series they did just that, Spock's brain, which is taken out of his body and reimplanted by the good Dr. McCoy, Chief Medical Officer of the USS Enterprise. They put the little devices in and they had him move different parts of his body. So clearly the answer is yes. Take a look at this recent demonstration though from a company called Neuralink. They implanted a computer chip into the brain of a young man who is completely paralyzed from the neck down. Now he is able to telepathically control a computer mouse, pointing the cursor, even clicking just by thinking it. Neuralink gets a lot of attention because it's owned by Elon Musk. You will often see it written as Elon Musk's Neuralink. Not just Neuralink, but Elon Musk has competition from lesser known companies as well. And that includes a company over in Switzerland called Onward Medical. They are researching ways to overcome paralysis with a device that can read your thoughts and convert them into movement. In this case, a man who normally cannot move his legs can walk. A brain implant is wirelessly sending his thoughts to a second implant in his spine, allowing him to move his legs. And how in the world does that work? How does your brain interface with a computer? Where is the line between your own thoughts and that of a computer code? And how long until this technology might reach clinical use? Not just for spinal cord injuries, but for other conditions, but not to make you the Borg. Another cool Star Trek reference. With me today are some very smart people asking those same questions. Dr. Paul Camerana is a neurosurgeon and the clinical service chief of neurosurgery here at the University of Kansas Health System. Dr. Randy Nudo, I said it wrong. Randy Nudo <laughs> is a neuroscientist who has devoted a large chunk of his career to researching brain computer interfaces, or BCIs. He's the associate director at the Alandon Center for Aging and the vice chair of research at KU Med's Department in Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. And he has a fun connection to Elon Musk's company that we're going to hear about in a minute, and a cool connection to Star Trek. He almost went up to me this morning. Dr. Adam Rouse is a, also engaged in BCI research in the Department of Neurosurgery. He's the director of the Precision Neural Dynamics Lab at the University of Kansas Medical Center. This is a cool panel, people. The clips we just saw showed people with spinal cord injuries. That's a patient population that currently doesn't have many good treatment options. There's normal activity in the brain, but because of this injury, some interruption of the spinal cord, those signals can't reach further down in the spinal cord and tell your muscles to move. Why, it is so, why is it so hard to fix a spinal cord injury? Dr. Camerata. Well, thanks, Steve. Uh, some of the problem is the scar tissue that develops. So uh, the spinal cord is a, a very, very sensitive organ. The nerves are very sensitive, and a, a slight shock can render them uh, inactive. Um, sometimes they're interrupted, and uh, there's very little regeneration in nerves. That's another, another problem. So I would say the regenerative capacity or the poor regenerative capacity of nerves combined with the scar tissue that forms in that area after the injury. So it's like your brain's a power plant. It's trying to send power down to the muscles to move, but the electrical wiring just got broken. Interrupted, yeah. And somehow it doesn't work anymore. How's that for an explanation, Dr. Nudo? Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. I mean, they, uh, with spinal cord injury, it's very difficult for those, uh, those nerves to regenerate. So we have to come up with some novel ways. And, uh, you know, I think neurotechnology has, has really uh, solved this in a new way. Uh, in order to uh, bridge that, that gap, so to speak, and uh, when you, you intend to move, that you would be able to, uh, and when your uh, brain is, even though the spinal cord is injured, those neurons that control your muscles in your, uh, in your hands and legs, they're still operating. Uh, uh, not quite like they did before, they don't have anything to operate they're, because of the connections are cut off, but they can still process that information. They can still make those, uh, create those signals to initiate the movement, and, and the trick is to, uh, to actually listen to that command signal so that you can use it for another purpose. So that, that's pretty cool. Now, are these really electrical signals or chemical signals? What kind of signals are they that travel up and down the spine? Well, we, we say that they're uh, electrochemical because uh, as the, the wires of those nerves that go from the, the, uh, the brain 
down to the spinal cord uh, we call axons and those axons convey uh, that signal electrically but when it gets down to the end of the uh, of the neuron uh, then it, it causes the end of the neuron at the, at the so-called synapse to release neurochemicals that depolarize or cause membrane changes in the next neuron, the motor neurons that control the muscles and when that uh, membrane potential changes there's another signal in that motor neuron that goes out to the muscle. So it's an electrochemical uh, a process. It, that's, it is pretty amazing. Now here, here's the key question. So the brain, how does this brain computer thing receive and interpret signals from the brain? How does that work? So you have you know, a set of electrodes or uh, wires basically that are listening in on those electrical signals that those neurons are normally generating, but now you can listen in and hear you know, or measure how active these different neurons are. And so now we're recording from hundreds, 200s, you know, maybe up to 1,000 neurons at a time in a motor area of the brain, and then it's up to the computer then to decode those signals or try to come up with some kind of algorithm that takes those channels of activity and generates that to some sort of output, you know, and so whether that's a uh, cursor on a computer screen or a robotic arm or whether you can even stimulate the patient's own muscles to control their limbs again, um, it's all about decoding those channels of neural activity into some kind of output. Yeah, okay, this is science fiction, right? We're, we're talking science no. fiction, this is reality? This is reality, yeah, no, it's, uh, oh, it's pretty cool. These guys have, been, have been, been at this for years, too. You know, they, they've been able to uh, have animals, and not only animals, but people, move, you know, robotic arms. But it's like, I don't want to remove, move a robotic arm, I want to move my arm, arm. So, yeah. so how's that gonna happen? So technology's gotten advanced. I guess these medical devices have gotten smaller and smaller. So um, what kind of brain implants are folks using here? Well, so there, there are a number of different strategies to try and bypass that blockage that Dr. Nudo spoke about in the, in the spinal cord. Um, and, and they vary from implanting things actually in the brain and uh, making it, uh, you know, actually activating parts of the brain that are still working to bypassing that completely and putting implants both. So the Swiss device that you saw has an implant in the spinal cord and in the brain and it wirelessly sort of bypass or, you know, goes around, short circuits the, the blockage. So I think it, this device picks it up, moves it past the blockage, goes down to some part of my spine and, and, and interrupts and then says to my body, go ahead and move that leg. Yeah, and, and what's really this amazing. This is like a detour on the highway, right? That's kind of what yeah, this just, is. Yeah, it's very simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Nudo can talk to this a little, little bit more, but what's really cool is the, the amazing plasticity of the brain. And so if, if you watch some of those uh, Neuralink uh, videos, uh, the, the gentleman who received the implant talks about, you know, initially I was trying to very accurately move my my cursor like my hand was moving and then I just sort of thought well let's just have the cursor move around on the screen and so uh, it was uh, it's really uh, interesting to hear him talk about it and, and a, a testament to how how uh, the brain is so plastic and can can uh, make things uh, even if you you don't have the implant perhaps in the exact right place uh, sometimes these things uh, the brain can work around it and that, that's kind of crazy so Dr. us artificial intelligence how is that going to affect all of this yeah, so, you know, so we've been doing brain computer. I want some of it too, by the way, a little bit. <laughs> smarter, sure. A little better memory, a little better, yeah, go right. ahead. Yeah, you know, to me that. Yeah, so when we talk about, you know, artificial intelligence, really what we're really just talking about is algorithms and really advanced algorithms. And so people have been doing brain computer interfaces for a while. And so you can think of a simple algorithm. You just take a couple neurons or a couple channels. If it makes it more active, it goes to the right. If it makes it less active, it goes to the left. But as we get more and more advanced, do all these AI or deep learning algorithms and so forth, you really start to analyze you know, patterns or different things that allow you to do much more complex things. You know, now we're seeing a real explosion in the brain computer interfaces and their ability to do language and with all these, you know, predictive language models now, you can decode these signals, you can have relatively simple signals that are generating really complex, you know, sentences and things like that just because these algorithms have gotten more advanced with these, you know, advances in AI. And so that's really, you know, it's an interesting and fun interplay between brain computer interfaces and the AI algorithms, you know, because your brain is obviously learning and adapting and we're still 
rely on that brain and the plasticity to really allow you know to be able to control these devices um, much more than you know what you could do if, when you first plug it in or whatever the patient clearly is learning and getting better at it and your AI algorithms are continually training and getting better at it too so um this is pretty amazing, but Dr. Nudo, you've got a story to tell too, because before it was Elon Musk's Neuralink, was it really Randy Nudo's Neuralink? Well, in fact, it was. So um, this is a little cap that we, uh, uh, we <coughs> developed this company called Neuralink, with a capital L, by the way. Um, and um, we were making, um, uh, we were really interested in developing brain-computer interfaces uh, at that time, uh, this was back in 2008, and if you recall, the Iraq war was winding down, the Afghanistan war was winding up, and traumatic brain injury was the signature injury of that war. There were a lot of spinal cord injuries as well, but traumatic brain injury was the signature injury. Which is kind of a concussive injury in that case, wasn't it? Yes, from all the explosions yes, from the explosive yeah. devices. And, and so we were, uh, the uh, Department of Defense was very interested in trying to develop new technologies to, uh, uh, to uh, repair the brains of injured soldiers. And so, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of those kinds of injuries and those, uh, those veterans are here living with us now that, that don't have a lot of support for that kind of uh, high-tech care. So we, we developed um, a, uh, a device and this was the actual uh, original Neurochip, uh, Neuralink chip that we built, uh, and it's uh, not unlike what Elon Musk chip looks like, uh, except that uh, this, in order to be implanted in a human, this would have to be encapsulated, uh, and then the electrodes um, uh, go down into the brain. And just to to emphasize the evolution of this, we had eight electrodes, eight probes into the brain. Elon Musk's device has over a thousand. So it's an evolution of the technology. But this would potentially be implantable. And so we, we so developed you, you, that. You open the skull, you put it into the around between the brain and the skull, and you put all these electrodes in there to read signals, and somehow you all have figured out how the signal is the right one to move a leg. Uh, that's right, and, and a lot of that is you know, the kind of work that uh, Dr. Rouse does in, in decoding those signals is very critical in that process. Um, uh, so uh, this, this is really an evolution. That is amazing. So talk to us, uh, Dr. Rouse, how do those signals get decoded? Right, so like I said, it's all about you know algorithms, and so you can think about you're measuring these neurons, they're spiking or having action potentials that are these impulses that go up or down, depending on what you're doing or how you're moving or whatever, and so you're going to somehow combine these signals, and obviously, like I said, you know it gets more and more complex the more channels you have. And so in my lab, you know, we're thinking about I'm you know I'm a neuroscientist. I'm interested in thinking about how the brain encodes movement. Um, and there's really kind of two different focuses of my lab, I'd say, or whatever. And so one is you think about how can you move with such a large dynamic range? So, you know, Dr. Camerata, he's an excellent neurosurgeon, but I also happen to know he's an excellent softball player for our uh, neurosurgery softball team. Seriously? Yep. <laughs> and uh, when he, when he no, you know, he can move, uh, you know, very precisely when he needs to move precisely, but he can also make large gross movements to hit a softball. And so for brain computer interfaces right now, they kind of move all at the same speed a lot of the times, kind of slow and so forth. And that's what I'm really interested in is how is the brain, and it's kind of the same neurons, but they seem to be able to change your patterns to have you know, large dynamic range naturally. And so how do we do that with a brain computer interface? And then the other thing I'm interested in is how do we control all the different joints and limbs? You know, So if our arm and hand has 27 different joints or degrees of freedom, um, I can reach down, pick up this water bottle, and I don't really have to think about how to coordinate those different joints. Um, how do we, th you know, how does the brain do that? You know, and the challenge is, you know, we're recording from hundreds, maybe a thousand neurons. There's 86 billion neurons in the brain. There's so many different patterns and so many different ways. And how does the brain kind of organize and do that? And then the big question then is, how do you learn and adapt to do different things, learn different tasks, and all those different types of things? And so, you know, it's all about trying to figure out how to take all those channels of activity and intelligently combine them into output signals that really allow you to drive things. Um, you know, and obviously it's a continual, continual challenge to try to figure out you know, that how that all works. That is crazy. So now, currently there's a handful of test subjects that have these uh, brain computer interfaces. What's the pathway to clinical care? This becoming standard of care. 
Well, it's going to be it's going to be years, Steve. Uh, obviously, uh, the the path is to first prove that these devices are safe, and that there's no harm from them at all, and then that there is some benefit, and then there will be some. Uh, pivotal trials that the FDA will approve and various centers will uh, do it on a limited number of patients. We, we already use some BCIs, as you asked before, in epilepsy surgery where we record from the surface of the brain. We even penetrate the brain with certain electrodes. But we're talking here about, for instance, the Neuralink penetrating the brain with uh, a thousand different electrodes on right. the surface. Uh, uh, all of these, uh, there are different companies and, and so different, that take different strategies. One of them takes a, uh, a, a catheter-based electrode, like a, almost like a stent, and navigates it up through the blood vessels to the very large vein on the top of the head and measures signals that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one does the bypass down to the spinal stimulator uh, uh, from the brain and then there's Neuralink. So uh, what will happen is one of these or more will tease themselves out over these trials into being the most beneficial uh, and then uh, we'll go down that road. Is there an ar a research arm around softball to see if you can actually hit better? Because well, I heard some other things. We've <laughs> talked about that. Much. I mean, well, it's interesting you should ask. I suspect there are several defense agencies around the world that have already experimented with uh, BCIs uh, in terms of sort of uh, uh, augmenting uh, certain senses uh, in humans. You this know, is the future secretive. of medicine is crazy. Yeah. And it, it's got so much potential for good. It does have a little potential for evil, and we have to be careful with that. You guys talked a little bit of AI and a little bit. How do we prevent AI from being the bad AI? Okay, Dr. Ross, I think this is your, you got the MD, PhD Whatever. thing behind your name. You're stuck right. with this one. Yeah. No, I mean, it's an excellent question. You know, I think um, as things currently stand, you know, I think there's some concern with these brain computer interfaces, you know, can it read your mind, you know, can you control it and so forth. And at the current state, we're putting it into kind of the motor areas of the brain, which are kind of the last output before going down the spinal cord. These patients seem to really, you know, still have to focus and generate signals. You know, it's a, still a little bit harder than having to move your own limb. And so I think in terms of reading your mind or those types of things, I think that's still a bit off. Um, but yeah, you know, it's changing fast. And I think we have to continue to think about, you know, what's the best way to build the proper safeguards in place, make sure that these patients are, you know, have the safeguards, have, um, you know, ethicists that are involved with those processes and so forth, and we continue to, you know, identify and, you know, what's safe and what works and so forth. But, um, you know, I think a lot of it's, you know, like I said, it's a little bit overblown, but in the same sense, it's something you've got to be continue to keep an eye out. And, you know, AI, as we get better at using it, there's going to be some times where, you know, it spits out, you know, garbage or whatever. And so you've, you know, all these different diagnosis things and so forth, you're still going to need expert clinicians. And we really need to figure out how to educate our clinicians to better use these tools so it's really a team effort um, rather than, you know, just relying on any kind of AI. We're, you know, we need to make sure that there's always those safeguards in place and yeah. something we're always talking about. And Dr. Nudo, I've been talking about this whole field and this feels like the $6 million man, another cultural yeah. reference you and I will both understand. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How far away are we from that? Well, I, I, again, this is an evolution, and, um, and it really requires not only a lot of smart people and a lot of great scientists and engineers to work on this, but it requires a lot of money. And that really was our, our roadblock. The, the, the cost of the device itself is relatively small, maybe a few thousand dollars to even with fan, the fanciest electrodes. But the the amount of research and development, just like uh, developing a new pharmaceutical agent, uh, you know, the drugs aren't expensive because the materials are expensive, they're expensive because all the research and development that's required and investors that are required to pump in, in this case, in the, in the area of neurotechnology, uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And so uh, having someone like Elon Musk uh, come into the picture really changed the game in a big way, uh, and he's really uh, carrying through. So uh, this is this is the challenge: is that it's very expensive, and that raises a really important a, a, another ethical issue that's very important: who uh, who can afford these? Right. And if we you know we have these fancy neurotechnologies that are developing uh, every day, you hear something new uh, about it, but our uh, or is it only going to be reserved for the Tesla drivers, the, the ones that have the high-end Tesla? Or 
or are we going to be able to have uh, uh, products that anyone can access? And, and that's a really critical problem for, the, for our ethicists in, in medicine to, to figure out. It better be everybody can have access. Yeah. Otherwise we're okay, so now if I'm going to have Pauline over me, I'm going to just, my mind to your mind. Now, if you're a truly a Star Trek fan, you'll know that's what's right. right. telepathic. Are these devices going to read telepathically? Or are we going to be sending signals back and forth? Um, you know, I think that's probably still a little ways off, you know. So one of the things that Elon Musk has developed is that these are now wireless. The patient that received this implant was wireless. A lot of the other previous pilot studies, you know, required wires and a pedestal coming out through the head. So, you know, certainly being able to wirelessly communicate with a computer um, is something that's now, you know, real and po possible. Going from one brain to another, um, you know, we're still a little ways away from that. Uh, we're still a little ways, you know, so one thing that's, we can get good motor output, trying to put sensory s signals back in. We're doing, so there are some people that are doing that. That tends to be more artificial. It doesn't feel as natural and so forth, but it is possible to give a little bit of, you know, sense of touch back to patients that are paralyzed. Um, but right now, you know, I think the motor stuff is ahead of the sensory stuff. Wow, that is amazing. I couldn't use these one time when I was trying to convince my wife to marry me. <laughs> it took me four years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, the questions that could be coming in. We are here to answer your questions. Send them using the links on your screen, from YouTube, Facebook, the X platform, or email the Medical News Network. Let's check in, check in now with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, Doc Hawk, Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control. Hawkeye, how are we doing? That's interesting science fiction oh, and crazy. medicine right now. It's crazy. That's pretty cool. Um, right now, uh, for COVID, unfortunately, back to that, we are doing actually pretty good. 11 active infections in the hospital. Again, hoping as we are now kind of having SARS-CoV-2, COVID be a more seasonal respiratory virus. We're hoping for decreased overall circulation of the virus, and that leads to decreased hospitalization. So hopefully over the next few weeks, we will see that getting into uh, the single digits. and maybe at some point down to zero as well, that would be good. Um, so 11 active inpatients right now, Steve. So. Pretty amazing. So yeah. bird flu, H5N1, mm. was detected in Kansas cows. Yeah. No threat to humans, but seems strange to see in a dairy cow. Help us understand that. Yeah, and I think they're seeing that all over. You know, again, influenza viruses can infect uh, uh, birds, so the avian influenza, but also other, uh, it can affect mammals as well, including humans and livestock. And they've seen infections of other livestock and other animals um, throughout the world. I think it is, uh, it can be somewhat concerning. You know, I think in Minnesota, they had some goats that were infected on a farm. Here we have uh, cows. Why is this important? Because we know that humans can get infection with avian influenza. The most, uh, the most significant right now is H5N1 influenza. Um, and there has been uh, numerous reports of non-sustained but human-to-human -human transmission. So I think it is important to understand that, that not only uh, birds, you know, especially uh, chicken farms that may be infected, uh, wild birds, of course, but also now if we're having livestock infected, I think it is important for those workers around that livestock and the farmers to try and take precautions to help reduce their chance of infection uh, because infection uh, can be somewhat fatal, up to 50% or more more fatality rate with this infection. Now we do have treatment for it as well, um, our influenza treatment, but still you, you don't want to get it. So I think it is important to understand that and hopefully all of our farmers and all of our people working with livestock around the state uh, and around the region will understand that and hopefully take precautions to help reduce their chance of infection. Obviously good hand hygiene, wearing gloves, wearing a mask as well. And so I think it is important to understand that. Um, have reached out to KDHE for any comment, um, but uh, other than that, we'll just kind of see how it goes. Hopefully, we won't see any human infections uh, anytime soon. So there's a new monoclonal antibody out there, Pemgarda. Yeah. Um, it's the first one we've had since uh, Evusheld was pulled in January 23 because the virus had changed and no longer could really tr uh, be treated by um, uh, Evusheld. But Pemgarda as a monoclonal antibody. looks like it's fairly flexible, mm -hmm. looks like it's really geared to the current lineages, yeah. does have some side effects. Talk to us about it. Yeah, so I think, I think the first thing is there were initially uh, published studies over a year ago, so February 2023, looking at the parent monoclonal antibody to which they have developed this one, which as you said, does have activity um, against current variants, including the JN1, which seems the most 
dominant around the world and in our country at this time. So otherwise, um, you know, it does seem to be safe, but there have been some reactions to it. Anaphylaxis is the most important one. Not very many people, but it does carry black box warning for that just to monitor. I think it was like four out of more than 200 patients had some anaphylactic reactions. Um, but otherwise, I think it is one more good thing to have, especially for, again, most people, the pandemic is over, but we have to understand and be sensitive to the subsets of our populations that can still be very affected by that, especially the immune compromise. Uh, this is an antibody that you give prior to infection, so this is kind of a protective antibody. Um, it did show very good results at three to four to six months out, so it is a long-acting, broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody to help protect against um, infection, but also severe disease as well. Hopefully this will uh, be available soon. And again, for our immune, it is for moderately to severely immune compromised individuals. You give that prior to infection, um, but it does not take the place of vaccination. We should say that, so you should be vaccinated. You can now have the ability to get this uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis monoclonal antibody. And then of course, if you do have infection, especially if you're high risk or immune compromised, have that plan to, to test early and test often, and then get on the antiviral if you can. All right, so we know many of you have questions. Let's head to Studio B with Alexis. Alexis, what do you think? Uh, Paul wants to know, how would this device be powered? Oh, great question. All right, who's taking it? I think those guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example from our original uh, Neuralink device and uh, we uh, in this device uh, it, this is a prototype but it used a, uh, a, a very small watch battery basically and that's all it needed and um, it would last about 24 hours and um, the uh, but these implantable devices it's a much more sophisticated battery that can be recharged and you do that magnetically and one of the actually the technical feats that the must team uh, uh, did was if you have this thing in, inside the skull and next to the brain, uh, then it, you, if you're magnetically charging it, it might heat up. You might see that on your cell phone when you're charging it with the uh, a magnetic inductive uh, a, a, a device. So uh, they have de developed products that would not heat up. So that, that actually changed uh, the game quite a bit. Uh, so, but if you watch the video, the uh, and by the way, the, this this kid is such a great spokesperson yeah. for this. But he talked about playing video games all night long until the battery ran, ran out. out. So I think he went <laughs> seven or eight hours. C and Civilization and six, I think. Yeah, was Civilization was six. <laughs> was great. What a story! That's amazing. Jeremy Alexis. Yenser has a question. Jeremy wants to know, is this limited to helping with movement or could this ultimately be used as well on things like aiding memory function or improving the way your heart and lungs function when those don't work properly? Well, that's a great question. I'll help you with the heart and lung one. You had to take us on to this question about uh, the first part of that. So, memory, yeah. so I memory, oh, I forgot the you know, question. Um, yeah, so there's certainly certainly researchers looking into looking into memory. Um, you know, once again, I think it's a challenge to. The nice thing about motor studying the motor system is there's a ground truth. We you know we've looked at you know when somebody moves or when you know an animal moves, what are the signals and so forth. What exactly that memory is is a harder question. It's something that people are trying to tackle. Um, there have been, you know, vision implants. So there's ways to stimulate to provide visual feedback. Um, I mentioned somatosensory and so forth. So I think the sensory motor is certainly farther along, but people are thinking about ways to possibly augment um, memory. Um, also, you know, once again, we've talked about stimulators for epilepsy. Uh, also possibly psychiatric illness, so mood disorders, depression, those types of things, being able to send, you know, provide non-pharmacological um, electrical stimulation that improves those things. So I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, for some of those types of things. Um, like I said, it's all about trying to, you know, the farther you get away from the sensory motor system, the harder it is to kind of know what are we really trying to drive the nervous system to do, but we continue to study and better understand that, and that continues to advance as well. Pretty cool stuff. So to answer that heart-lung question, we already have pacemakers, right? They actually help control how fast the heart moves. Yeah. We have ways for 
different things to help our diaphragms, uh, transmitters to help our diaphragms work when you have a paralyzed diaphragm and you can't breathe well. And there are also devices that are now electrical stimulators that help to improve sleep apnea because you, uh, it, it stimulates your throat to stay open. So there are different ways that these have already been applied. The one part I haven't seen is to regenerate tissue that's been really scarred. To back to your original thing, if there's a, some tear in the spinal cord, now you got the scar tissue, we've not been able to regenerate that, nor can we regenerate lung or heart tissue per se. Yeah, there are, there are scientists all over the world working on, on that, and they have been for decades, making progress, but very slow. And this, this is really taking off. So. Yeah trying to bypass the injury. Yen Liang has a question. He wants to know, is it possible for people with cerebral palsy to walk without help by nanotechnology? What do you guys think? Cerebral palsy? Um, you know, so there's, you know, certainly possible opportunities to help those patients, I think, as well. Um, you know, one of the challenges, the farther you get along from the initial insult or whatever, the less opportunities you have to either you know provide stimulation that helps restore things or whatever helps recover those types of things but you know there's certainly certainly continue to be possibilities for all these different um, movement disorders I think you know I think cerebral palsy is certainly another one that may have a lot of opportunities I have one more question that Kathy just texted me Kathy wants to know if thoughts are invisible how does the implant detect a thought Oh, uh, that's a, that that part was amazing, Dr. Nguyen. Talk to us a little bit about that detection of thought. Yeah, so uh, it, you know, uh, we could talk for hours about what thought but really yes. is, but mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what the uh, uh, what we can hear in the nervous system are simply uh, these changes of membrane potentials, the the electricity across the membranes of the nerve cell changing back and forth, and we can place a very fine wire to detect those small electrical changes. Uh, and we can get down to the single neuron to do that, and we can listen to individual neurons. Um, uh, but is it thought? I mean, it, it, the closer you can get to those neurons, the better, and you probably know that you can you can actually listen to the brain from outside of the skull, uh, and there are uh, there are uh, skull caps with electrodes on the surface that can actually li listen to brain activity. But it's very crude. So it's sort of the analogy I use: if you're at a, an Air, at Arrowhead Stadium and you want to know what that famous person in the in the uh, skybox is saying about Travis Kelsey, uh, and you had drones flying around you would be able to tell what their conversation is. You might hear a roar when, it, when he makes a touchdown from that part of the field, but you would not be able to hear his conversation. And so when we think about uh, listening to thoughts, it's really getting down into that, that level of the individual. And so uh, we, we need these probes to go down to the individual neuronal level to detect that. All right, one last question, Alexis. Chuck wrote in and Chuck writes, Elon Musk tweeted that the Neuralink patient has good neuron spike detection. What is neuron spike detection? Yeah, so, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, so you have these neurons, they have the electrical signals, and the way they send electrical signals is these little, what we call action potentials, or little blips or little spikes. They're small impulses that travel down the wire of the neuron um, and so we're recording those. And so what Elon Musk is saying is that those electrodes that they implanted landed right close to a one individual neuron. And so they're getting the individual spikes from a neuron. You know, like as Dr. Nudo just said, if you're listening on the outside, you just kind of hear the roar and so forth. But they're actually the electrodes and, you know, most of these invasive electrodes, you can get one individual neuron that you're isolating. You're seeing the spikes from that neuron. And then, you know, assuming they have lots of them, you know, up to a thousand channels, lots of neurons. But that's what Elon Musk was saying is that they're getting spikes from individual neurons. They're not listening to kind of broad global electrical activity. They're really finding individual neurons and being able to decode what's happening at the individual neuron level. And we have billions and billions of neurons, so we're yes. going to have to figure out that because we can't have billions and billions of probes. Right. At least that I thought would be against. Right. Anyway, those are nanoprobes, so that's kind of cool, too. Well, this has been a great discussion. I do feel like I've just come to the future, and I'm grateful to all of our guests for being here today. I want your final thoughts, though, before we go. So uh, I guess my final thought would be, you know, I went into neurosurgery 30 years ago um, because I thought it was a vast frontier and there was so much about it. We, we didn't know and so much to learn, and it's still that way 30 years later. I'm really excited to, 
to uh, continue to train train folks to go out into the world and and help advance this technology. It is amazing. Dr. Nuda, final thought. Yeah, I would just say that this is the tip of the iceberg. and It's it's a new technology and it will have fits and starts just like Tesla's crash and spacecraft crashes. We're gonna see fits and starts with this device, but over time, uh, this will evolve into a, a completely new way of treating brain injuries. Yeah, and you know, this was, you know, we talk about this as the infancy of the clinical brain computer interfaces, but this has taken a long time. Um, a lot of neuroscientists have been studying the brain and the motor system for a long period of time, allowing us, and you know, a lot of this started out as basic science, not really knowing where any of this was going. And then as you continue to better understand those signals, we develop better electrodes, all those things working together. And then you bring in the AI component or whatever, and you have so many different possibilities with that. And you know, AI, a lot of those uh, algorithms and so forth, they have what we call artificial neurons, and so they're built with what our understanding of the brain has allowed us to build better algorithms and so forth. And so I think there's just so many different ways that this has been, and brain computer interfaces have been likened a little bit to putting a man on the moon or kind of a moonshot in that it's cool technology, it's relatively small populations that that particular thing is going to help, but there's so many different opportunities, I think, that are learning, uh, what we know about the brain now, helping other diseases, whether that's helping rehab for stroke, something like cerebral palsy, all those types of things. Just our knowledge about the brain and our better devices and so forth could allow th many more opportunities for medicine besides just what the classic brain-computer interface might look like. Ah, that's so cool. Hawk? Yeah, I think th this is um, just another story of how we need to continue to embrace and trust transparent research uh, in medicine and science and other areas as well and continue to progress and move forward. We've seen this Neuralink. Uh, we now have a new monoclonal antibody to help protect those most at risk from COVID as well. And I think we need to continue to embrace that. Again, be transparent and talk about it and, and answer people's questions as well. But uh, we need to continue to be moving forward. Uh, and one final thought I forgot to mention earlier, we actually had more COVID emissions last week than influenza, but both are still low, which mm -hmm. is great news. Yeah. Okay, I want to leave you with two final thoughts that are a little disparate, but I think they're, they're true. First of all, and I was a long time ago and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, I had a neurologist say to me, just remember, remember, the body's made up of the brain and all of its support organs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you think about where we've gone in medicine, the final thought, the second thought is, you know, when the, uh, the start of Star Trek is always out of space, the final frontier. But in medicine, it's like the brain is the final frontier. And what you heard today is a little bit about that journey and where science and hope and wide-eyed optimism are combining to move a field forward, to help people move again. That is a remarkable journey and the greatest journey of all. Thank you all for being here. We'll be back next week. It's a milestone few hospitals have reached and it's having a positive impact for patients. I'm Alexis Del Cid. On the next All Things Heart, we celebrate the technique that eliminates the need for you to go on blood thinners. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.